Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of It's Going to Be All Right. I'm Clayton Gwen. And I'm Niklas Mitrovic. And this is uh, a redo, so usually we get episodes out uh, a bit sooner than this, but um, we had a few technical difficulties. Um, we basically only got one half of the recording that we did earlier this week. I forgot to click the record button, more or less. No, that's what It happened. wasn't that. No, you. Uh, we had some other technical difficulty, and as you were sorting that out, it ended up stopping... <laughs> The recording on Nicholas's side of things, but um, we're back. We're here. We we had to wait until the end of the week to find time to do it. But uh, better late than never. I also guess. think it's uh, yeah. I, I of course it is, and I also guess that. <clears throat> I also think that it's it's nice that we have some days in between, like the first conversation, because we had a pretty good conversation about this topic, and, and yeah. then uh, just doing it immediately immediately after that would feel a little bit strange so it's nice that there's a couple of days in between so it feels fresh again yeah i've almost forgotten about the conversation and many of the major topics so hope it was a good conversation so we feel bad that we lost it but that that's the way that these things are when you can't be in the same room together <laughs> all it right happens. well enough of enough so of what the is the topic what is the topic that's a good question we are looking at the idea of Writing enriched curriculum, or, or we're going to say WEC as well, because uh, everybody loves acronyms, right? Yes, everybody Plus, it sounds loves really acronyms. cool. Like it, it sounds like you're just going to beat somebody. I'm just, WEC. Well, I'm, I'm going to WEC you. I'm going to WEC you real good. I think I think about uh, like, uh, are you WEC? Nah, man, I'm WEC. <laughs> I'm WEC. <laughs> totally different thing, man. <laughs> so, so what is it? Well, you said it, it's, it's something called writing enriched curriculum. So it's kind of like integrating uh, writing and, and learning how to write into a discipline or into a course or into a program. That's what it is. <clears throat> so the yeah, difference is, yeah, continue. Maybe. Oh, I was just going to say, and it, it uh, happens at, at many different levels. So it could be... Kind of, I guess the way that we're approaching it is more from a program length. Uh, so, you know, working at a university, uh, a bachelor's program, um, enriching curriculum with writing mm. through the length of a three-year bachelor's program or a two-year master's or a, uh, a three to four-year PhD, for example. But we, yeah, we, that would be the best, I think, because then it would have some continuity uh, mm -hmm. and we can kind of build complexity gradually. But at the same time, we also try to do it course by course. Um, this is a little bit more technical, but when we start to talk about the WEC approach, because this started out with there was all these different writing courses and, and, and they're great. Uh, but we always thought that the best way to teach academic writing to students is to put it within the frame of what they're interested in, the program that they're a part of, and kind of understanding that in order to become better at what you find interesting, uh, being good at writing is a part of that. Then Definitely. you can express your ideas and thoughts in, in the most clear way possible. And we also think that... Uh, there's a certain link between getting better at writing and getting better at thinking, Be mm -hmm. getting better at organizing your thoughts and expressing them. Um, so writing courses are great, but if you could use a course, for example, as a vessel for training in academic writing, that would be the best. So yeah. we started out by me and you trying to get in touch with different professors, talking to them and trying to get them to integrate academic writing into a program or into a course. Uh, with you know different kind of methods and approaches um, and it worked with some professors and with um, and within some programs and other people we haven't heard anything from mm -hmm. so but we it need is to growing. find something new it is growing yeah but we needed to kind of expand on this and find a new approach as well so we decided that um, all the students use canvas and all the courses are in canvas so if we create some canvas resources that can be moved around and integrated into any course then that's probably the best way to integrate academic writing into whatever we find uh, yeah anything yeah especially for the way that we work because you know we are trying to create writing as a universal 
approach, recognizing that scientific and academic writing take many different forms and have many different genres across different disciplines. But there are kind of foundational elements of writing, uh, of pre-writing and, you know, of organizing and outlining um, and the way that you can write to be, you know, clearer, more cohesive, more concise. Mm. We treat those as, you know, we say it all the time, the writing principles. And we think that the benefit of having writing enriched curriculum with these writing principles is basically that we can offer resources and services in support of every type of academic mm. writing because we're not worried necessarily about content or format or layout so much as we are about these core principles. And you hinted at a couple things that I think are really critical as well as to why is the WEC approach important? Well, you said that there is this link between quality writing and quality thinking. Mm. And I definitely agree with that because I usually end up saying that the majority of the writing work that you do is not writing at all. Yeah. Right. It is your research. It's problem formulation. It's uh, preliminary research, getting general background information. It's brainstorming ideas. It's coming up with good research questions with researchable questions, yeah. organizing your ideas as you're reading and analyzing uh, information, forming connections and interlinkages, organizing all of those ideas into something that can become writing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would say that there's a lot of there's a lot of focus on some of those skills in different courses, um, developing other skill sets. Um, but then writing kind of ends up lacking where the other part of why WEC is so important is that writing is better seen as a skill, just like critical thinking or like riding a bike. Let's say you've got um, a five-day course to learn how to juggle. Okay, well, what can you really get across in five days to teach somebody how to juggle? You can give them a couple of basics, but then it, it's ultimately, are they going to practice juggling every day? Are they going to go and learn new advanced juggling techniques? Um, mm. Do they have the motivation? Do they have a reason to juggle as well? So let's say you take um, a juggling course the first yeah. day, first day of clown school, and you know you go through a three-year <laughs> clown <laughs> clown program. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then in the final examination, in your final thesis, you have to demonstrate your juggling skills. But but you haven't practiced juggling since your intro to mm. juggling course, um, you know, three years ago. Are you going to yeah. be that good at it? Probably not. Probably so, not. So, I mean, <laughs> maybe the clown analogy was not the, the best one. But I think the point is, is that WEC is also something that's really critical for a lot of disciplines that don't have a lot of writing as part of course assignments through a program. So you can't assume that a one-off, one semester writing course is enough to teach everybody how to develop these skills and obviously interlink them with the other types of research and critical thinking skills that they're developing through the program as well. Sure, and uh, back to the juggling analogy because I mean, it was pretty funny and, and kind of fitting. Um, <laughs> the thing is that you need to like, if you want someone to be good at juggling, after some a course like an introductory course then you have to integrate juggling into any other things like oh mm -hmm. but can you balance on that thing while you juggle or you know you have to do it like that you have to make it a part of uh, what the clowns are supposed to do in different contexts yeah uh, that's how you get better at it and that's exactly. how you kind of apply it to different scenarios uh, so it's in, it's embedded and constantly mm. being enriched and and maybe, if someone is if if like the master clown is is looking at you and are supposed to evaluate your performance then they are evaluating how good you are at you know performing some kind of trick and you're juggling at the same time and it's the same thing with writing mm -hmm. so if we integrate ac training in academic writing into a course <clears throat> then you could always um, evaluate the content that would be program specific but you could also evaluate how it's communicated and that would be how it's written that could be done at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that goes on in this process around the idea of writing enriched curriculum because it isn't it isn't one activity, uh, and it's not something that is just done by one party either. Um, 
And that's why, you know, we have such a focus on it with what we do at the Writing Center, because the Writing Center is really like a skills development around, specifically around writing skills for students. Um, but we're also trying to be able to reach out a bit further to work with professors, too, because, yeah, part of it is the the final product that you end up needing to deliver to, say, get a master's mm -hmm. thesis or to, uh, or sorry, to get a master's degree or a, a PhD uh, title of a doctorate, you have to write a thesis of some, yeah. sh some sort. And, you know, there need to be clear expectations for how that will be assessed and, you know, the quality of it. But there's a lot of kind of missing steps in between that I often see as taken for granted. Yes. Um, and to realize that, yeah, professors have a lot to do. How do you, how do you further integrate writing to enrich curriculum? Uh, and I think one of the good starting points is to kind of consider that you can't just expect the students to know how to do this stuff. I guess that was a big point of what we had talked about when we first tried this is there's almost an expectation that I've experienced at university, talking to professors, talking to students, being a student, you know, working on the side of professors as well, that students should just be expected to know how to do all of this stuff. You come to university <clears throat> to learn knowledge around <clears throat> a specific discipline, around certain methodologies, uh, and to apply what you already know to just advance your understanding of things. But yes. th I think there's been a big change in a lot of education. And a, a case in point would be story time. Uh, before I came to Norway, as I've mentioned in some previous podcasts, I was working at a, a language school. I, I've got my education and professional background in second language acquisition, teaching English to, um, to non-English speakers. That's why and you're so patient with me. <laughs> that's why that's probably why I ended up marrying a Norwegian as well, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I was talking to some friends' parents um, about, you know, what my job is and what my education was. And they said, oh, well, you, you must be so good at grammar. And I said, no, actually, like, that's kind of one of my weak points. I'm still really learning a lot of English grammar. And they said, what, what do you mean you're learning it? Don't they teach you that in school? No, in elementary really. school, in, in middle school, in high school, the focus where I went to school was not on grammar, not on punctuation. It was around being able to string together good ideas, to think critically. And, you know, I had to learn a lot of this stuff that was just natural for, you know, my parents' generation um, hmm. that they knew because they were educated in English grammar. So these sorts of changes... We had the opposite thing here. So I remember was, when... It was more focused on grammar when I was in primary school, <clears throat> uh, both in English and Norwegian, uh, but not really that much on critical thinking. Mm. Uh, so we do had like we had a lot of group work and stuff like that. But I can remember like having grammar tests and stuff like that when I was a kid. A lot of that. Um, mm. So a little bit different than that. I think that's a good segue into what a lot of Norwegian students experience at the university because they're expected to suddenly be good critical thinkers but they haven't really they have no practice uh, and a little bit of story time from my from my uh, from me um, I remember when I started at the university in Oslo um, and I had exfil like about all the mm -hmm. philosophers and, and ethics and uh, like the, the classic philosophy um, and I remember we were supposed to choose one philosopher that we would write a, a, like a term paper about, like a literature review, where you would explain like their core concepts or something, or concepts that you just found interesting and you wanted to uh, say something about. Um, so that was like the first term paper that I ever wrote uh, as a university student. Um, and I had no clue what an academic text was supposed to look like mm -hmm. and what I was supposed to do. Uh, so I remember I was like taking this, that that, uh, that term paper really seriously, and I was kind of feeling like a, a fish on land because I wasn't really sure what they wanted. So um, that was a, a real good learning experience. Um, fortunately, we wrote so many term papers. I mean, from from being a, from my a first year student until I was done with my master's thesis, I don't know how many term papers I written, but it was kind of not unusual to write 
three or four ter term papers each semester. So mm -hmm. I've written quite a few. Uh, and at the same time, so we got a lot of writing training, but it was not really like any explicit training in critical thinking. And that's mm -hmm. something that I think would be beneficial because it's uh, one of the fundamentals for academic writing. Definitely. So this is one of the, what I had called disconnects when we mm. first um, tried recording this, that there's a bit of a disconnect between the experiences that professors have who are teaching at university, who probably went through a different educational system that had different focuses on what was being taught uh, and mm. have different expectations than the students who are, are coming in. Uh, today. I even see that from, you know, now that I've been out of high school for f how many years? 15 years or something like that. Um, yeah. And talking with younger people and kind of realizing, oh, you know, they, the educational landscape there is shifting so much. It's Working with 17 or 18 or 19 year olds who have come through the writing center, you really, you really do see like, whoa, you are, you've got a lot of understanding of how to navigate the school system. Because you've yeah. just learned how to regurgitate, like it, to take in and regurgitate information out to get the how grade. to power game the system in a way. Mm -hmm. But you're not coming in with a good understanding of why, you know, asking that kind of question. Why would we do this? Um, why is this important? Um, why do you think this sort of way? And I'm not necessarily sure if that is always encouraged in a lot of university classrooms hmm. either. So one of the other disconnects that I see happening between developing these cumulative skills that build up towards quality writing um, are maybe not also that focused on uh, in, in being instructed. So when a professor uses a pedagogical approach to stand up and kind of passively lecture to their students. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we've all experienced this. The common, the trope, if you will, is the PowerPoint slide full of talking points. And the yeah. professor just talks about that. And everyone is like feverishly writing down word for word what is on the PowerPoint. And that's what they'll study from. So when you're doing this sort of verbatim uh, repetition, um, you know, absorption, just absorb what's on the PowerPoint. Uh, I'm just going to read what I've already written on the PowerPoint. And this is the stuff that's going to be on your final exam. What good does that do students when they're supposed to write a final thesis where it's mm. supposed to be new original research that asks quality questions that applies the knowledge and the methods that have been taught um, to demonstrate capability. So very we little. Yeah. So we end up with oftentimes these sorts of um, program curricula that have a disconnect between the expectations of the professors and the expectation of the students. Um, we have a disconnect between what the end product should be and the main delivery methods to get there. Mm. And then I would also end up saying that there's there's maybe too much of a focus on grades and like how do you end up grading someone's ability to think critically or find quality literature outside of mm -hmm. a source um it, and that stuff takes a lot of time so i, I don't fault professors either because they it's do very have, hard yeah it is it is very hard um but i think the point is is that this writing enriched curriculum isn't supposed to be something that requires a complete overhaul so much as a better understanding of how do the teaching methods and the learning outcomes and the writing skills that you want to see develop in your students play out from semester to semester to semester, course to course, mm. year to year, from entry of a program to exit of a program? Mm. I, th I think that the writing principles will, if this works the way I kind of envision it will work, it's, it's kind of like a building um, something that you in pedagogy would call scaffolding building a framework mm -hmm. around the students so it will make it easier for them to produce some kind of scientific output. Um, so if they know how to write the sentence, know how to write a paragraph, know how to express their ideas as clearly and as effectively as possible, that will help them stand on their own feet at some point and hopefully also produce ideas that are uh, novel to a certain extent. Um, but it takes some practice. Um, 
and I just think that mastering the 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 medium of communication, writing, is is an integral part of that. Yeah, you can't would, you can't really avoid it. No, I would even argue that writing is so overlooked because a lot of people think you know students and probably professors as well think that well you know we just need them to be able to write for the final assignment or the final essay uh, mm. exam or their final thesis and there's a lot of students who are going around thinking oh you know like it's it's so silly why bother with writing at all like yeah you just have to do the thesis and then you're done you're never gonna have to write again after that well you have to you're going to have to write every day how many people actively pick up the telephone and call each other anymore and uh, you know i grew up in the telephone calling generation uh shortly before it was surpassed by the instant Text message, message via yeah. internet uh you mm. know the msn messenger era so we're moving so much more towards communicating through writing again, as opposed to necessarily always calling people up. And I think no matter what job you're going to have, you're going to have to have some form of written communication. Emails cool. to colleagues, reports that you might have to end up writing, um, you know, budgets that you'll have to end up producing, um, pitches that you want, whether you're pitching it to a company or you're an entrepreneur, um, receipts that you're going to need to make, mm. and understanding like what is important and what needs to fit and how do we get it all in there and how do I make it as clear as possible so the client or my colleague doesn't end up misunderstanding me, you know? Think about it this way. like. Most people that listen to this podcast are uh, students at some university, for the most part, NMU. All of you are going to end up in a job which <laughs> will include lots of writing. None of you are going to be carpenters or you know, digging ditches or something like mm -hmm. that. Then you would never listen to this podcast. That's, I'm not saying that there is a carpenter here and there that has been listening to an episode or two, but I don't. that's not our main audience. So all of you is going to communicate your ideas by writing emails by you know proposing different solutions to things sending your boss you know a page of text where it, it, he wants you to make a draft of some kind of structure that's what you're going to do <clears throat> even though, uh, it doesn't matter if you are going for a scientific um, career working as a researcher or a lecturer, a teacher, you're going to work with writing. That's the main medium, uh, mm -hmm. except for talking. Um, but being good at writing will also help you uh, being good at your oral, oral presentation skills, being good yes. at talking, presenting your ideas in front of other people. Your, um, your ability to, as you had said earlier, you know, the link between quality writing um, and quality thinking is, you know, uh, unescapable. So... Mm -hmm. Very often when you're even just trying to come up with a good idea, um, you're probably, I mean, if you're like me, you've got post-it notes all over the place. Like, oh, when a good idea comes, write it down, even if it's just um, a bullet point so that you don't forget it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, use that as a tool of organizing and, and improving the thought. Um, and taking notes on things as well, too, is a, a way of developing skills in critical thinking and problem solving um writing and as what well what kind of notes you take yeah that's okay, also so, a big thing yeah so here's a case in point um little off topic and it's gonna we're gonna go into a different kind of nerdery um i've said it before so i play in a a band and you know with the, the current lockdown you know it's hard for the band to get together and we're recording uh an ep we see we kind of produce one every year and you know, my, my thought coming to the close of this is with it being so hard to get together, you know, we have so many great digital tools available if you're a musician um, because you can just write everything on a computer. But the problem is uh, it's starting to become so prefabricated that how do you end up sounding like yourself? And I thought, well, okay, I run a podcast. I've got microphones. You know, if, if we were recording the video or you go and watch any of our other videos on YouTube about this podcast, you probably see a guitar speaker cabinet sitting behind me. Um, long story short, I'm trying to create digital snapshots of this, the, the interaction between the speaker and the microphone. And the process is actually quite simple uh, if you understand very basics in audio production. Um, mm. But I've been taking notes the whole time because I realized, well, there's a million other people out there 
doing this thing. Uh, and I could just go and get anything that they've produced, but I want to do it myself and I want to make it as good as the quality of the stuff that you can buy from the big names in the music industry. And it's really important for me that I'm able to do that. So I'm sitting here, okay, you know, test run first, you know, um, okay, compare it. Oh, what are my notes that I have to write down? What am I listening for? What could I do to try to improve? Well, maybe if I do this again, and, you know, I'm going to go through several rounds of this, but the notes is so important for me to track the development of the idea. Mm -hmm. um, even though it's not something I'm going to produce as writing, you know, writing is an integral part of me going through this process to create a product. So just another case in point of showing how you know, being able to have good skills that intertwine thinking and writing can be very valuable outside of university. But to bring it back into university, uh, I just want to return to the um, the sort of like day-to-day -day disconnects that can happen and why this writing-enriched curriculum can be so vital. Um, so let's think about what is the common thing that happens when there is um, a course assignment. It could be a written mm. assignment. It could be a group presentation, whatever it may be. It could be a lab report for all I care. Um, but I mean, what do you think the first thing that the students want to know about that assignment is going to be? The first thing that they usually ask for or what they should ask for? Uh, the first thing they usually <laughs> ask for. Uh, how long it's supposed to be, how many references they have to use, uh, what is like the minimum amount of references. Yeah. What is the bare uh, minimum of the amount yeah. of work I need to do to pass this, mm. right? So like it's, it's do it, can I pass this only using three references? That's like a, one of the standard questions. Yeah. Uh, and then there's um, like some really specific things uh, like uh, what font size should my subheadings be? Yeah. That's yeah. actually a pretty common question, believe it yeah. or not. Not really like, the, what's the overall structure? How should I, what kind of sections should this text consist of? Like, How no. much analysis do you want in this? Yeah. Is this supposed to be a summary? Um, is it a report? You know, am I supposed to take this as like a, a literature review? But, but the, just the, the thing that we get these questions so often is uh, it's indicating a problem that I feel like it, 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 it comes from, uh, it starts a lot earlier in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, when well, they are all thinking about all these really like detailed things, like one thing is like how many references and how little do I have to do, but all this very detail-oriented stuff is not really that important. And there's a bunch of guides that will inform me how to do that. Uh, but there's more there's there's a lot of bigger things that will uh, uh that will make a text good or or not good uh, mm -hmm. that you probably should focus on and it seems like some of these course responsibles don't do a pretty poor job of informing the students about what that actually means and what it yeah. is so that's another disconnect that happens right that this would fall under the category of expectations that i had talked about earlier um but the student's expectation is, what do I need to do to get the grade? And the professor's expectation tends to be something quite different than what they're asking. So mm. I've, I've probably said this before because we've now been podcasting for a year. We're very close to a year. Yeah, so, uh, over a year. Over a year. Over we a year did already. the first right. podcast before the lockdown. We had yeah. one podcast that was recorded in the studio. Woo! Happy yeah. one year anniversary! <laughs> I don't even know when that happened. No, it's, me neither. Uh, oh, just we're a like an sign old of getting couple. so caught up in this. Yeah. Okay, but we're like an old couple <laughs> that forgot our, you know, our anniversary. Like, uh, what do you call it when you've been married for like fifty years and you're just like, oh, oh, did that happen? Fifty years. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Cool. Was... High five. <laughs> but, <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. Well, that. Yeah. Cool. But um, where was I uh, talking about? Uh, oh, yeah, the disconnect. Mm. Um, so I think there's also a disconnect that happens in the minds of the course responsibles because I always need to remind people that at a university, it's very rare that you actually get someone who is educated as an educator. You're being mm. educated by people who have been educated within their specific scientific discipline. They're a researcher, yes. 
of some kind. You know, they're a microbiologist. They're uh, an organic chemist. They are educated as an urban planner. And there's very different methodologies and thought processes that go on there. But then mm. one thing that I end up hearing from these professors very often working around issues of writing with students, they say, I don't know what the problem is. My students can't write. Well, is it really that your students can't write? Like, are they illiterate? They're incapable? No, what I really mean is they're, they're not delivering the deliverable that I want. They're, they're not showing analysis. You know, they're not mm. being inquisitive. Okay, did you ask them to be? Let me see your assignment instructions. Okay, you're asking them to review and critique three or four different authors or theories that uh, were presented within the course. So you're wanting them to summarize information to demonstrate that they can just kind of remember some of this basic stuff uh, and critique it probably insofar as what is their understanding of the different perspectives presented. Mm. Your assignment is not asking them to analyze. It's not asking to show insight. So you have a disconnect between the the methodological approach that you're trying to use to meet these objectives that is mm. incongruent with what you really want them to do. The, the, the core here is that I think there's two things that play in and kind of produce this type of outcome or this scenario. And one of them is that a lot of these professors, there are they've been professional researchers. They're, they're obviously really good at what they're doing. They, they would not be a professor if they mm -hmm. if they're not good at what they're if they're yeah, not and, excelling in their field and um, I'm not diminishing their their knowledge or their skills within no, no, no. their their discipline so don't take that one the wrong way on me but it's but it's a it's a problem because uh, we, we, I took the same example the first time we recorded this episode and um, I've heard just heard this interview with uh, like one of the strongest climbers in the world at the moment and he's like a 21 year old American uh, and the interview is really really bad he's he seems like a, a great guy but he has no perspective on his own abilities mm -hmm. he can't explain it he's been climbing since he was three years old and it's just so integrated into yeah. him that he can't really explain what it's like so what, and how I, he's able huh? isn't this where I ended up saying it's like um, you know the joke that I always do is when someone asks you how to do something the the answer is always well first you need to visualize the action, and then you actualize the vision. The vision. It's like, <laughs> it's like what the hell does that mean, what? right? <laughs> so you have to think and then do. So, yeah. Um, so it's kind it's of like It's not really that, that helpful, right? It's very unhelpful. Point. And him trying to explain how to do like the difficult, most difficult climbs in America, which is super technical. It, like it, it's, you have to practice a lifetime to do them. And mm -hmm. he's, he's, yeah, you just have to like pull really hard. It's that explanation doesn't help anybody. Like yeah. if you want to explain to someone who's trying to do that uh, that climb how to do it, that 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 won't help because they're obviously trying their best. Yeah. And the same goes for students trying to like analyze something, think critically. They don't know how to do it. They don't have uh, fifty years of practice. Mm -hmm. So you have to break it down. And one good way of doing it, which is it's a pretty standard approach approach in pedagogy. And once again, a lot of these professors, they're not ed educated educators. Uh, they are, you know, uh, educated in something completely different. But recontextualizing is usually a powerful tool. So if you mm -hmm. ask someone to describe or define a concept, for example, from uh, developed by some author, um, and then apply to a new context, then you have this recontextualization process going because then they have to uh, be able to use that concept in order as a, as a lens, as a, mm -hmm. almost like a pair of glasses to, to try to, to see a phenomenon from a different perspective. Yeah. Um, and I think this reconceptualization is really useful because I was in a course, a writing course, and someone had ended up asking, uh, this wasn't me, but um, I remember this question really well because it, it stuck in my head for this very reason, like you said. Um, the answer that was provided did nothing to answer the question. It, it barely even addressed that it was a question. But the student for the final assignment was trying to get some clarification and asked, um, okay, so we're supposed to write a reflective paper 
to submit for this course. What do you mean by reflection? And the professor's response was, uh, well, okay, you know, there, there was a, a bit of interaction that went on, so the question got clarified to like, what, uh, what basically amounts to reflection? Uh, mm. And what is a reflective paper? And the professor's response was basically this. Well, a paper that doesn't demonstrate any reflection would not be a reflective paper. And you get this sort of tautological uh, argument of circular <laughs> reasoning all, that yeah. it never it never answered the question. It didn't no. even really validate that it was a good question to ask and someone was looking for some clarity. So there was zero reconceptualization that went on. Now, a better answer, I think, would have been to say to that student, reflection would be the way I would like to see it and grade it within your final assignment for this course would mm. be a demonstration that you can see the relevance of some or all or a few of these ideas that have been presented and be able to think about how it would apply in a practical way to the research that you're doing. And what could possibly happen. Yeah, That's what, kind and, of, yeah. and extend beyond that, right? So, yes. okay, there. Uh, that still leaves a lot of leeway. Obviously, a reflective paper is open to a lot of interpretation, but it clarifies that, okay, so what am I asking? I want you to engage with things that have been presented in this course, include some of that information, particularly what is you think is most useful, probably talk about why you think that it's useful, how you think you'll use it, and how you think you'll benefit from it. Now, mm. there, that, that go would, write to paper. Hey, that that, is a lot that's easier. not so hard. But that lack of reconceptualization is a big problem. And I, I think and that, that also be, ends up stemming from, just like you say, maybe not necessarily... Not necessarily even knowing that you're poorly communicating your expectations to your students. And, and good teachers and trainers, they would do this all the time. Like, okay, just let us take an example here. Uh, if I want to explain... That's, that's exactly it. Mm. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt for any other the reason than said, but because you said, let me give you an example. You're recontextualizing yeah. the idea. Exactly, and, th and that's what you should do. So pay attention. Okay, so now for um, the example, sorry. I... Now for the example. Uh, if I am supposed to try to explain to a carpenter how you could use different concepts in the social sciences to analyze something and create a conceptual framework, um, think about it like a toolbox. Okay, what kind of tools do you need in order to uh, fix a lamp? You open the toolbox and you pick up what you need. You need this screwdriver, you need that, you need a, a clamp or tongue, uh, what is it called, a uh, wrench. You need different things. So you only pick the tools you need because you don't need the whole toolbox. Mm -hmm. And then you go and you fix your lamp. And that's it. That's what it's like using different concepts to analyze something. You have to pick concepts that fit the, the phenomena. There's no reason to you know, introduce every concept in the world because that won't really uh, help mm -hmm. you anything. So another thing, uh, let's say climbing as an example. Uh, if I want to introduce a person from a different sport into climbing, let's say from football or from dancing, or I could always like, yeah, this move is kind of like, um, you know, you have to put your heel on the side just like you would do when you do that kind of movement in dance. Oh, okay. Then it will be easier for them to understand. You will yeah. compare it to something that their body is already used to doing, or uh, describing it using terms that they're already used to uh, when they when they're thinking about what they're, uh, you know, what they're interested in. So the the idea of the toolkit, I think, is a really useful one because using the right tool for the right job can be very beneficial. And I think that a tool that you can end up actually using that is beneficial both for the students in a class as well as across an entire program curriculum is Bloom's taxonomy. And we've talked mm. about this before in, in more detail, um, but a quick rundown of it. Um, how does Bloom's taxonomy really work well? Uh, I would say f starting across a curriculum, it's a good tool because professors for that program have to try to establish where along the taxonomy these certain um, 
critical knowledge skills are developed. So those skills are basically at the lowest level, remembering, then understanding, then applying, then analyzing, then evaluating, and then finally creating. So you could take mm -hmm. this and say, hey, you know, by the end of the first year of a bachelor's, we want students to have a full understanding of the important concepts, theories, et cetera. Uh, that's relevant for this course. Okay, second year, we're really going to start building up their ability to apply that understanding, to use it in new situations and draw connections across their different ideas, starting to uh, get closer to forming their own ideas. Then by the time they reach the third year of this program, we want them to be able to evaluate things, you know, mm. that they can make a, a justified stance or a decision based off of all of these other sorts of knowledges that they have. And then when they come into their master's, you know, for a two-year program, they're well primed. So we can keep working on grooming this evaluative skill and, you know, every step along the way through a program, you're kind of reconceptualizing because you're always reaching back you know, okay, mm. hey, you remember from last year and oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. I understand it. Okay, good, because now we're going to apply it. Mm. Um, and you can kind of work your way up that way. And then I That's think it's- That's one way to do it. But, yeah, but another then, way to do it also is by focusing on, let's say, three concepts. Then remember them. And then in the same semester or in the same course, you're supposed to apply them. You're supposed to analyze something using them. You're supposed to try to create something new with exactly. uh, combining these different concepts. And then- Next year, when you're introduced to a couple of new concepts, then you've already, you will automatically connect the way that you can use a concept to analyze something to how you used the concepts you learned the previous semesters. So that will make it easier for you to kind of internalize the new knowledge because it will fit very neatly with something that you already kind of custom to do or that you, mm -hmm. you know, you train to be able to think in, in those terms. So that's also another way to build it. The point here is that there is power in kind of taking that internalization process really seriously because it's all mm -hmm. about trying to connect some kind of idea that I want you to remember to something that you already know. I really want to integrate it into the things that you already know how to do. Uh, that mm -hmm. will make it a lot easier for you to apply it and to remember it. Uh, that's the point. Not we don't really want people just to reproduce some kind of fact, but we want them to to use these ideas or thoughts or approaches as as tools to create something new. And then you're at the top of the pyramid. Exactly. And it it interlinks from you know you have to be able to think about the big picture, the full curriculum, and what the final outcome, particularly if the outcome is a large piece of writing and you don't have a lot of writing. How can then in individual courses, you know, these concepts, these ideas, ways of reconceptualizing, and then also ways of developing writing skills um, be integrated at the course level? Uh, and mm. this is where I also find that um, the Bloom's Taxonomy is really good. Uh, I'm going to share this resource. Um, I know we're not putting this out as video, um, so if you're on YouTube expecting to see this, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have time right now to be editing a lot of videos with other things we're doing, so I'll just provide a link. But it's a very basic image developed by Evelyn Bailey. Uh, hmm. from She calls it the levels of critical thinking, and it applies Bloom's taxonomy and the remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, create, but links it with actual forms of writing that can end up taking place. So this is where I think it comes back to become a very useful tool for the individual professor. It doesn't take a lot of work, but thinking about what are your expectations? What do you want students to produce by a piece of writing in your course? Um, and being able to understand that the assignment you ask them to do is linked with these different levels. So for example, um, if you just do kind of an expository or a personal narrative, like say a reflection paper, basically all you're really asking for people to do is recall events or orders of things. Um, just repeat facts. Mm. You're not asking mm. for much more beyond that. But if you move It's like into, a quiz. Yeah. But if you kind of go in and move towards, say, like a literature review or a critique... Um, you're starting to ask people to then explain, like identify important ideas or theories or concepts, explain them, uh, report on them, give a description. Um, you know, you can move a bit further up and kind of 
deal with more abstract ideas or uh, you know you can ask for analytical papers then where you're actually asking them to differentiate or relate or compare and contrast different ideas different theories different methods and you see we're slowly moving up in levels of complexity in what we want students to develop um, hmm. You know, you get to the evaluative stage and Evelyn says that that's where you start doing more persuasive forms of writing. So this is where you're actually getting argumentative papers, hmm. position papers, um, recommendation papers, papers that are, you know, actually requesting that something should change based on the research that has been done. And then you actually kind of get to the scholarly level of writing at the top of Bloom's taxonomy, um, which involves your ability to synthesize um, to form original hypotheses and test them and form arguments to support the validity of those research questions or hypotheses, um, you know, and, and to analyze and kind of work your way back down all of those steps to, to understand why it was important that you did this and that you applied the correct method and analyzed the results and analyzed the work that you did, you know, exactly what you'll do in a master's or a PhD piece of research. Um, mm -hmm what worked, what didn't work, and why didn't it work? Or why did it work, and why can we trust these results? So a simple tool like this is a great way for professors to reconceptualize their, their assignment instructions to ways yes. that actually give information very easily to their students as to what they really expect. But that comes down to understanding the format of a, of a paper. You know, what is it precisely that you want students to do so they have a tighter framework to work within? I mean, which what you start with um, when it comes to the Bloom's taxonomy is kind of up to the course responsible and what they find to be the most fitting for the project they want the students to work on. But what I do find really important to address in, in this particular episode is we talked about this a little bit, uh, yeah, like 20 minutes ago, but it's uh, examination forms. And then what you expected to do as a master's student when you work on your thesis. If you're trained if you only have in-school exams and then you have have to to produce a master's thesis you're in trouble uh, because you're not i mean we talked about this a little bit in the first time we didn't record this episode uh that in an in-school exam you're there for like four hours and you just try to you know just regurgitate as much information and facts as possible in four hours and then you're mm -hmm. out of there and then you get a grade how is that even relevant to real life like i've never been in a situation where probably not you know now you have to write something in i've had deadlines which have been relatively short but but nothing like that mm -hmm. and then it's usually producing some kind of new idea yeah or solving a problem not just like say as much as you remember about you know, one specific thing in two hours. Mm -hmm. Never, never going to happen. Yeah. So what skills are you really teaching students if that's the expectation? Um, you're teaching them how to find information that is just factual, that can be quickly memorized and written back and Quickly again. forgotten. Yeah. And then easily forgotten. We're basically, we're training people to become really good at pub quizzes Mm -hmm. But we're not really training people to think more critically. Or, and and or that's, that's almost the problem that I hear a lot of the time professors say as well, too, is like, you know, they're just, people aren't internalizing this. Well, yeah, but what emphasis uh, have you given them or what impetus is there for them to really internalize this? They just need to know what they need to know to pass the course because of the way the course is designed. Yes, so the course is poorly designed, and it's even worse when I know people that have had exams, and I've also had an exam like that once, that was, uh, you only had a couple hours, and then you were supposed to, like, answer a bunch of questions, and suddenly there was, like, a stress factor involved. Mm -hmm. So then the exam was more about how good you are handling Under stress. a stressful situation yeah. dun, than you are at... Under pressure. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Yeah, exactly. And, if, if you can... If you can manage under pressure, um, you're going to do pretty good, right? And how is that relevant to the job that I have now? Yeah. I mean, sometimes I'm under pressure, but it's nothing like... It's not a four-hour time crunch. In 60 minutes. And yeah. Then, I mean, if you're going to be a... What do you call like... Um, in Nor Norwegian, it's flyvelled. It's the one that it's in the tower at an airport. And they and the flight keep track controller. of the traffic. Yeah. 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 Then you're the, under the pressure. The air traffic controller, yeah.
You disappeared for a while. Okay, sorry. Yeah, air air traffic controller was the last thing I said. Yeah, air traffic controller. So then you're under pressure. Then you need to pay attention, and they only work for like I don't know a couple of hours or something, and then mm-hmm. day is over because they yeah. they need to be so sharp all the time. But you know, most jobs are not like that. So for jobs where that is a requirement, then you should test it most mm-hmm. definitely. For a job as a researcher in a laboratory, not really. It doesn't I mean it's it's not relevant. Uh, you're going to train the students in handling a situation that is very unrelevant to writing a master's thesis. Then it's stress on a completely different level. Then it's like a year of stress, <laughs> long-term stress, mm-hmm. not short-term yeah, stress. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's the difference. <laughs> and yeah, no, I, I also want to just preface this next bit by saying we're not sitting here, you know, shitting on professors because there's a lot of good ones. Um, what I really want to stress with this is that there is a difference between criticizing a person and their capabilities and criticizing a, a design of something. Mm. So this would fall under the same sort of thing that it's it's different to criticize an individual person for acting a certain way because of their religious beliefs um, or, or just hating on that person because of, you know, their religious beliefs compared to, you know, all of the problems with the associated institution. So it's the design that we're really focusing on here. So it's more the system. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, and like, I can understand it because if you don't have a background in pedagogy, uh, and even if you are really passionate about teaching, you just might not be aware of a lot of different ways that you can think about what you're doing, or you might not be aware of kind of the the implicit assumptions that you end up having. And here's a good a good thing that I think you and I do is when we give workshops or or lectures or webinars, you and I are always sharing back and forth. You know, hey, you know, am I clear? Am I communicating this idea clearly? Uh, am I missing anything? Did I kind of overassume something? Um, and like, it's so important that we have that contact so that what we do and present is more robust, that it's it's more holistic and it answers a lot more questions. Um, I agree. And, and it's really hard to know how many professors are having those conversations with each other who are, are linking, well, this is what I'm teaching and these are how I'm teaching and this is the assignment instructions that I'm giving. Um, and to be honest, I mean, as a PhD, I don't have a huge amount of time to take on any extra. So if I had to teach as well, like I'd have way less time to make sure that I had really thorough, robust designs for things. But I'd try, I, you know, I'd want to. And I've got a bit of a background in it. So I can understand that there are these limitations that people might just, they might not see that the problem really stems from the interactions that they have in the classroom and the the expectations that they have aren't being met because of the design that they are using, even though everything is well-intentioned, right? I'm, I mean, as an example, I remember when I was uh, teaching pedagogical theory and I was supervising students, I was working on a kind of like a bachelor's thesis. And we would have a meeting and I would give some suggestions on how to construct a theoretical framework and what to use and which concepts that might fit their project and so on. And I was trying to explain how they could kind of apply it. Then they like, hey, uh, could you read through this? And uh, they, you know, they gave me, let's say, a 10 page or 15 page manuscript. And I would read through it. And then I would kind of like, wow, that's how you understood what I what I told you. It's like, this is a complete misunderstanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, to a certain extent, it's on me. Because this is, if this is a phenomenon that just continues to happen, then you need to adjust. So if there's a professor that is, or some kind of course responsible, or a teacher that is complaining about that the students can't write or something, and, and they see a lot of the same tendencies repeating itself, then you probably need to change your approach. Because yeah. you are the one who are You're the giving constant. them... Yes, right? you're the constant, exactly. And you're the one who's supposed to give them uh, knowledge about how to do this. So if you're constantly seeing misunderstandings and all that, you need to, you need to change your, uh, your approach. Mm-hmm. And a change in approach, okay, so now I want to speak to any students who might be listening, be you bachelor, master, or, or PhD. The change in approach for you is sometimes to just go and, and speak with someone different. 
you know, we've talked mm-hmm. about this before, the importance of talking about what you're trying to research and write about to someone who's a non-specialist, uh, but also to come to the writing center because one of my most memorable experiences was with someone who was, um, I can't remember exactly the discipline that they were in, but they came in and saw me maybe only three or four times. They were a PhD a couple of years ago and they were just under so much stress. You know, they've got to get their COPPA done. The program is coming to an end. They they still had uh, publications that they needed to finish writing and submit before they could put it in the COPPA. And they were just all over the place. And I said, okay, well, what's your supervisor doing to help? He says, I need to just get these things written. And he said, go to the writing center. You know, it seems like they, they help out with stuff like this. I don't have the time for you. Um, and we just broke it down very simply. You know, the guy was so focused on, you know, and I wasn't a specialist in his field, so we do what we always do. Like, let's just get the big picture. What are you trying to do? What are the questions you're asking? What are the problems, the puzzles, or the gaps that you're trying to work on? Okay, well, when you say it that way, like, th- it's no wonder you're struggling with this. You're trying to write about three interlinked but kind of different things so if we break Mm. them apart can you take the information in here that focuses on the problem that you're really trying to deal with and then can you find the stuff that is like a byproduct of trying to find an answer to that problem and realize oh well we have a problem but when we research it we don't really have enough information there's a gap here so you can't solve the problem until you've filled the gap there's two papers, just split them mm, mm, and find mm. the information related to each. And he says, what, like, huh? Can I, I can't do that, can I? Try, see what happens. Sure you he can. Came, uh-huh. He came back two weeks later and said, man, this was amazing. Like, I, I now know what I'm trying to do. I've got these two papers. Great, now we can actually help you to get through the aspects of writing. Like, you just, the organization and, and the approach that you were trying to take was just so convoluted and befuddled. Um, and you weren't really getting a lot of help because everybody around you is like too much of a specialist in the field to, to see the bigger picture of what you're actually trying to accomplish. And that's another pedagogical tool. You know, I Mm -hmm. have been actively working and promoting that idea of how are you framing your research? Because Mm -hmm. if you can identify it as one of those three things, if you can answer, you know, the big four questions that we're always talking about, what, why, how, and who, that kind of stuff is just totally missed in most university education. I've never, ever For had a class. For the most part. This is all stuff and, that, you know, we've developed at the writing center and use because it works. It just brings I'm, people back to basics sometimes. Sometimes I'm getting really surprised because what, why, and how was uh, something that I was, I think I was first introduced to it in high school, I think. Junior high at some point in like history class or something. Can't exactly remember the situation, but... Yeah, that was like the first time that that was uh, kind of like a method that we or an approach that we used in in order to to write uh, to to create a project. I think about mm-hmm. uh, it was wasn't uh, it like what, why, when, where, how, who? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, I think it was about those lines. And I think it was about like uh, some kind of conflict in uh, in Europe during the Second World War. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways. When I introduce students to the what, why, and how and the problem puzzle gap, when I'm lecturing, a lot of people are really surprised. Like, oh, I haven't thought about it yeah. like that. Because they, they start <laughs> out at, at such a higher level of complexity. So they kind of, they, they confuse themselves. Um, mm-hmm. They don't organize their thoughts. And they end up having this kind of, what you have been using, uh, you've been calling it organizational block. They, they're supposed to sit down and write. They don't know what to write. Uh, usually called a writer's block, but mm-hmm. it's an organizational block because they don't know what to write. So yeah. a WEC approach will start out with introducing these like main concepts that will help you in the pre-writing stage. All about organizing your ideas, how what fits, what doesn't fit. You can, uh, and and that's kind of like a big part of that stage is critical thinking. How is this like? How how can I construct this mm-hmm. paper? Why how is it can, even important that I research yeah. this topic, right? And how can I solve the problem? Yeah. Uh, and then the writing-specific things comes in uh, mm-hmm. after that. Yeah. And then it's all about like sections, sentences, paragraphs, you know, clarity, word choice, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, and it, it seems so think, basic, you know, when we sit and, mm-hmm. and talk about it this way. And maybe that's just it. Some of these very foundational elements that build towards writing are neglected because they're taken for granted 
it's we, over, yeah, that's what we it's, operate it's under the assumption that everybody just knows this stuff and mm. they know that it's expected of them. And if you just came out and were explicit about it in your class, in your course, in your program, to be honest, all you need to go and do to see how convoluted some of the learning objectives are is go read up on a course description when you're trying to look through a course catalog as a student. And, you know, sometimes the objectives are not really all that clear. Okay, you're supposed to walk away with, um, you know, with a better understanding or with a clear understanding of the important concepts relevant to the discipline. Okay, what Mm -hmm. you're telling me is you're asking for the absolute lowest rungs of knowledge development. We're going to walk away being able to remember some important facts that are relevant for, you know, understanding later. I don't see that we're supposed to walk away with our ability to, you know, have a a better understanding that allows us to implement and implement this knowledge into new circumstances where we can apply it to create new information and new ideas. I I think one of the big things, we we talked about this uh, earlier, but um, a lot of the people that work in in the university or in higher education, they kind of, at least in Norway, they expect that the students already know how to do Mm -hmm. this from high school. Uh, and when I was working with pedagogy, a lot of it was developing pedagogical approaches to uh, high school teachers. And one of the main things that we were working on was how to train them in, in critical thinking and how to get them to really engage in some kind of topic and understand it and mm-hmm. use concepts to analyze and, and so forth. Uh, and it's it's a real challenge because of many different things. This is kind of a, a long, complex discussion, but... To, to make a long story short, the point is that it doesn't really happen. A lot of students, they don't get trained in that kind of thinking. So they get into university and then there's an expectation that this is something that you should master. This is something that you should already know. And they don't. Mm-hmm. And then you end up like me, you know, writing your first term paper. Don't really understand what the hell you're doing. Uh, so then you kind of just, you're lucky if you're in a program that will, um, where you have to write a lot. And you're really unlucky if you're in a program that does a lot of other things and then you suddenly have to write your master's thesis. Yeah. I just had a lecture for landscape architecture students. They're mm-hmm. supposed to write their master's thesis and they've been drawing for five years. Yeah, yeah. You Like, that's uh, not a cool situation to be in. I was prepared when I was supposed to write my master's thesis. Mm-hmm. I've written a bunch of stuff. Yeah, but... if you're doing five term papers every semester... Yeah, you, you've yeah, got a lot of time bit. to develop that skill and, and improve it, right? Just like the clown juggling course. Exactly. You know? We had to use that all the time. We had to use that like set of uh, skills, that skill set all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're suddenly supposed to write, then, I mean, I've had that lecture for them. I tried to break it down as much as possible, but it's difficult because mm-hmm. they you have to introduce them to the hourglass structure, you know, yeah. from general to specific and then to specific to general. You have to talk about how is an academic text usually built up? And then you have to introduce them to the IMRAD structure, different variations of that that, you know, fits different disciplines and different projects. And then we have to, like, it's... Mm-hmm. I feel bad for them. And I, I well, um, and the other thing, too, is you have to remember <laughs> that the work that we do when, when we go in and do uh, most of our, our workshops, um, you know, if we're lucky, we get a full day. If we're really lucky, we get a full week. But mm. a lecture is two 45-minute sections. How much can you compress into an hour and a half? Not and who much. knows where in the point these students are? You know, are, are they writing their thesis this semester? That, that's the Are they no, writing that's next the, semester? Like who knows? You that's know, the norm, though. That I yeah. do a two-hour lecture, yeah. and and we we try to kind it's of tough. you know, it's 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 difficult because it's highly complex, and there's a lot of stuff to kind of. It takes some time to kind of to under. First, you have to understand it, but then you have to practice mm-hmm. practice it. Like one thing is understanding how to uh, how to structure a paragraph, but then you try to write one, and suddenly it's more difficult than you yes. thought. So it requires some practice. Um, the thing is that this kind of a this WEC approach with uh, creating resources in canvas that can easily be moved into any course that will inform the students how to write sentences how to write paragraphs how to write a section what a section is how to do the Mm pre-writing stage and what it includes i think that will that in combination with me or or someone else from the writing center coming in and giving a lecture about it 
four lectures maybe, and then four modules, and then uh, uh, a term paper that will be evaluated um, uh, on its contents, but also on how it's written. Mm-hmm. Then we're on to something. Then we're using yeah. the, the discipline across, as a vessel. Yeah, and across the whole program, having having core professors who teach courses at certain periods who want to encourage this idea, who realize, yeah, let's say landscape architecture where they're drawing a lot. Um, why not have part of one of those drawing assignments? You have to write a pitch. Hmm? You're writing because to, that's gonna to happen. sell this idea so you can format the writing practice to the pitch um, and, and to the field that you're in. But the idea is encouraging that, that writing and writing-related skills are continuously being fostered and continuously being practiced with a clear understanding of how they help build towards what you want your students to be able to demonstrate in the final thesis. And I think mm. it's so critical that it, it needs to start at the bachelor's level and work its way through because at the PhD level, I am reading course papers, I am reading other people's research articles, um, and I can tell you from you know needing to do group sharing where we kind of review each other's um, submissions for a course, there's a lot of people there who are still just doing the kind of the regurgitative approach. Um, mm. Oh, you know, these were all of the important theories that were presented, and I'm just going to cite them and go through and kind of more or less just give a summary of what happened, when it happened, where it happened in the structure of the last five days of the course. And it's like, and you're supposed to be conducting some kind of original research. Like you're not extracting. it's just an information dump. Yeah. You're just, you're just kicking back. You're parroting what the professor Mm. has told you for the last four or five days you know, are you actually engaging with this stuff? Are you putting it in the context of your research? And I do have to say, I, uh, I've, I've done that where I've contextualized every or recontextualized it to talk about what was relevant for the type of research that I've done. And professors were not very happy with the submission because, oh, well, you didn't, uh, you didn't refer or you didn't refer to all of the sources that were talked about. Well, that's because about half of them are irrelevant to the type of research I'm doing. I mean, I even said that. And, and it's I, kind I of crazy demi- that they you know, wanted you to, 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 to yeah. uh, refer to every everything. Yeah, so this stuff, like, it it keeps going upwards that I think that that's part of the problem is when the focus on both sides of a course is to just pass. And to just pass means regurgitate, reiterate, you know, parrot back information that is presented. You're not going to get good research you're yeah. not or, going to get good researchers. You're not going to get critical thinking. You're not going to get good writing. Or how you think you're going to master something. Um, yeah. You know, uh, this is something that you probably know quite a bit about. But uh, I remember I was talking to one of my good friends. He was learning Japanese. Um, and we were talking about just like, uh, what's the best way to learn a language? And everybody knows that the best way to learn learn a language is to move to a new country and just start to talk and talk to people. Mm-hmm. That's the best way to learn it. You're not going to learn how to read and write, but you're going to learn how to speak. Um, the worst way to learn a language is sit at home alone and just, you know, just practice uh, grammar. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to try to talk to someone and you don't even know how to construct. You don't know how to pronounce yeah. a sentence. You don't know, like if the if the conversation goes, goes outside what you have practice on, you, you don't know what to say at all. So... It's the same thing with any sports. I can't sit here and read about climbing and expect that this will make me better. Mm -hmm. If I practice at the same time, new perspectives can be very valuable, but you have to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's there's an interrelation of other skills, right? Okay, yes, you can have impressive knowledge about all of, you know, some sports team in all of their sports history. But does that make you a top level player if you've never gone and kicked the ball definitely not. no no you know so the a lot knowledge of them that knows a lot about soccer yeah so the the knowledge <laughs> and you know the skill need to be married together and that's mm. kind of what this whole writing enriched curriculum idea is about that it's not enough to just expect students to know things it's not enough to as a student expect to just do the bare minimum either um but it doesn't need to be something that is hard to integrate either because 
you and I are always making resources. We're working with students. We're working with professors. People are seeing um, the value of this sort of stuff and kind of becoming aware that, hey, you know, it, it's not a massive restructuring or complete remodeling of how a curriculum or a program is set up. It's more what are some of the kind of critical benchmarks that we want to hit? What are our expectations? What are the actual problems that we're encountering? Um, mm. And then what are the right tools to solve that? And that's where the Writing Center and the Learning Center is really happy to help out, to help tailor teaching approaches, to help tailor learning approaches, to help tailor service delivery yeah. to your students. Um, so it's not about turning things on its head. It's about more or less kind of what we've been saying in, in conversations between each other, making sort of the implicit assumptions that you have about what you want your students to do and just making them explicit, but also confronting the very like uh, the the very real weaknesses that are inherent in some of the ways that you deliver course material and, and course instruction to students. So if you are a student, um, get in touch with your course responsible and get that course responsible to get in touch with us so we can integrate some really neat resources into the course so you can learn how to academically or you can learn how to write an academic text with your discipline as the vessel and then it will be all right thanks for uh a redo an excellent redo actually yes i like that we Even got better to, than the original yeah i i think so Great. Well, again, everybody who's listening, we're sorry for the delay with this one. Um, you know, we'll we'll try not to let that happen again, but um, no. we'll see you in a couple of weeks, I hope. We see you in a couple of weeks, and I thank you, Clayton. Thank you for a good conversation, as always.